Washington Journal continues. Welcome back to Washington Journal. It's our weekly spotlight on podcast segment. And today I'm joined by the co-host of the Down Ballot podcast. David Neer is on Zoom with us. He is a Daily Coast political director and elections publisher. And David Beard is in the studio with us. He is the Daily Coast elections contributing editor. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. And Thank if you you'd like to uh, join the conversation, you can do that on our lines by party affiliation. The phone numbers are Republicans, 202-748-8001, Democrats, 202-748-8000, and Independents, 202-748-8002. Um, David Neer, I'd like to start with you. Um, you're the politics director at the Daily Coast. Remind our viewers what it is and the point of view. Absolutely. Daily Coast is the largest online progressive community in the country. We celebrated our 20th anniversary this year, and we are dedicated to what we like to call news, community, and action. We want to give progressives, liberals, and Democrats a place to read about the news and then also do something with it to be able to take action to affect positive change in this country. And the coverage that David Beard and I are involved in is specifically focused on elections. And as Beard will talk about in a moment, I'm sure, down ballot elections, the races below the level of the presidency that really never get as much attention as they deserve. And David Beard, tell us about that. The, the podcast itself, why you're deciding to focus on the down ballot. Sure. So I think, as everybody knows, the presidency gets an enormous amount of coverage, particularly relative to other races. And we have thousands of races across the country that take place, you know, Senate and House, but also further down ballot, state legislative races, mayor's races, city council races. And, and our goal is really to focus on those, to provide good analysis, um, you know, the best ways for progressives to, you know, volunteer, use their, use their donations, um, but also to understand what's going on in our country, because there's so many different races that people don't even know about. When you talk about judgeships or things like that, people aren't even familiar with what might be on the ballot. And that's what we're really trying to communicate to folks. So tell me about the podcast itself. What's the format? Who do you talk to? How do you set it up? Sure. So there's two main segments. We start off with a weekly hit segment, which is between um, myself and David Neer. And we basically go back and forth with a few of the you know, top hits of the past week, anything that we found particularly interesting or notable or worth talking about. And then we move into what we call a deep dive, which is uh, usually an interview with a guest. Occasionally we'll do something else, but most of the time we have somebody on. We don't have a lot of elected officials on. We have occasionally, but primarily it's uh, folks like analysts or folks who are working within an organization on behalf of certain races, things of that nature that can really give an inside view of sort of politics and campaigns and what's been going on in these sort of races that we're covering. And David Neer, you talked about this being a, a progressive uh, paper. And, you know, I wonder if that's your target audience or are you trying to reach a wider audience? Progressives have always been Daily Coast's first and foremost audience, but it's interesting that you ask that because we have always been devoted to being a reality-based community. And that means that if the news is tough for Democrats, or if honestly the news is good for Republicans, we are going to be honest about that because telling people to clap harder does not allow them to create change. You have to be honest and candid and straightforward with your readers. And we know that folks from all over the spectrum listen to our podcast. They follow Daily Coast Elections. Uh, we produce a lot of content, including a lot of data analysis that is of great interest to folks, regardless of their political leanings. But again, Daily Coast, still it, our primary mission has always been and will always be to support progressives. We like to say that we want to elect more and better Democrats, and that is always going to be at the core of what we do. Well, David Beard, uh, let's talk a little bit specifically about those down ballot races. You know, for instance, there's state attorney general, there's the secretary of state, um, state Supreme Court. Talk about the importance of each of those. Sure. So all of those um, positions have real impacts on people's lives in their respective states in ways that they may not initially uh, initially think about or expect. Obviously, we've seen just recently with state Supreme Courts and a number of states elect their state Supreme Court justices 
from anywhere from election integrity to abortion to voting rights and workers' rights. There's a ton of different things that state Supreme Courts ultimately have the final decision-making power on because any state laws, of course, they don't usually go to the federal judiciary system. They stop at the state Supreme Court and that's the final decision-maker. So who is elected to that court has an enormous impact on all of those issues. And then as we've seen with Secretary of State and elections and attorney generals as well, the, the move in recent years to you know, push conspiracy theories around elections and try to impugn the, the integrity of our elections, it's very important to have elected officials who are willing to push back and to stand up for the elections that we've taken and to, to show that they are being you know, run appropriately and these conspiracy theories have no basis and to keep conspiracy theorists out because that's what in a lot of these states in these races, it's between somebody who's going to you know, run an election well and fairly and somebody who's going to push baseless conspiracy theories about you know, any elections that they run and past elections as well. I want to put something on the screen. These are uh, 2022 municipal elections, and here are some of the offices that are up. Um, you know, you have a district attorney, which is kind of understandable, but then there's, you know, the coroner, the uh, Memorial District Board, Hazard Abatement Board. I mean, how do people even know what this is in order to make an informed decision and, and to, to make a, a vote? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And one of the things, we just recently had a, a mailbag episode and we had somebody from um, who's running for school board in a nonpartisan area, you know, where the school board is, is elected nonpartisan. And they were asking, how do people even make these decisions about who to vote for? And it's difficult, particularly with some of the, the types of offices that you mentioned, where I don't feel, you know, educated enough to know who the best coroner might be. And so oftentimes you'll find, you know, sort of partisan cues if there's a partisanship on some of these ballots and people will just vote for the Democrat or the Republican, whoever they, they tend to favor. And then oftentimes, you know, incumbency is very strong in these types of positions. You get elected coroner, people just vote for you, you know, for as long as you're on the ballot in these types of At things. At least you have experience. Yeah, yeah, they know you, they haven't heard anything going wrong at the coroner's office in the past four <laughs> years, right. so might as well Nobody died. stick with it, yeah. But it is very hard and there are offices, you know, that people, you know, don't know what they do, and then it's just sort of a, you know, un an unknown. People tend to vote whoever's the top of the ballot or, you know, whichever name they're more familiar with. You know, you've, we've seen studies that actually show that people with, you know, names, you know, Irish names have done well in a state like Ohio, um, you know, in offices where people don't have any better cues. David Neer, what about um, candidates for municipal offices running unopposed? How often does that happen, and what does that say about you know, the position and the availability of choices. It happens distressingly often. And I think this may be a somewhat unusual view, but I think it's quite possible that in America, we actually elect too many offices. You know, we were talking uh, just a moment ago about judicial elections. The rest of the world thinks that we are uh, completely off our rocker for electing judges. Almost no one else does that. It's a very, very strange system. And that also applies to those other offices that you were talking about, like coroner, uh, mosquito control board is another amazing example. And I think that we as a country need to take a hard look at all of these positions that we are electing and decide whether it's appropriate to or whether many of these positions should be appointed by people that we do have a better understanding of the jobs that they do. Should this position be appointed by the mayor or the governor and so forth? And I think that we probably would benefit from actually having a somewhat smaller ballot. David, I want to ask you about um, an opinion piece that was in CNN.com and it's titled this, Many Democratic voters are skipping down ballot races. And it says that um, even if Democrats buck historical trends and hold on to Congress, there is another cause for concern on the left. Democrats have a, quote, roll-off problem. Uh, first, describe what roll-off is and why does it seem to be a Democratic problem? Sure, so sure. roll-off. So, oh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't specify which David. Whoever, whichever one of you wants to take that. Uh, I, I, David Neer, I'm happy to take that one. So midterm turnout, the number of voters who show up in midterm elections is always much lower than in presidential elections. And again, this is a very unusual feature of American politics. Most countries don't have something like midterm elections. They just have one election every few years. Now, for 
many years, Democratic turnout in these midterm elections has tended to be disproportionately lower than Republican turnout, in large part because the kind of voters who tend to show up for these lower prominent, less prominent elections are typically uh, better educated and more well off, more affluent. And much of the Democratic coalition, many parts of it, tend to be younger voters, uh, people of color. Um, and these are folks who just haven't had as long a particip particip participation in our political system. Voting is a habit, and you have to build it up over time. And so as a result, the kind of people who tend to vote more often in midterm elections, older voters especially, have in recent years favor, favored Republicans. And so Republicans have typically done better in terms of turnout. They've lost comparatively fewer voters in midterm elections than Democrats. However, I need to stress that this has been changing. As we've seen in the Trump years, the Democratic coalition has become uh, more uh, affluent and better educated as these former Republican voters in these suburban areas have moved away from the GOP during the Trump era and beyond. And so I think, you know, this election will be a very, very interesting test case. But I think that this issue will start to mitigate itself somewhat um, as the nature of the Democratic base changes. And David Beard, um, talk about uh, split ticket. How often does that happen? Does that happen more for Democrats, for Republicans? Sure. It, it used to be a lot more common, you know, particularly around the, the middle of the 20th century. There was a lot less sorting by party, by ideology. And so people were more willing to vote for, you know, a liberal Republican or a conservative Democrat really across the country. And we saw that in, you know, an increase. There were lots of competitive races. There was a lot of ideological mixing where the most liberal or the most conservative House member wasn't necessarily, you know, a Democrat or a Republican. There was a, there was a lot more mixing. And that's decreased as as partisanship has become stronger, as ideology as ideology has caused more sorting between Democrats and Republicans. And so as a result, there is still some ticket splitting. You know, we've seen particularly with governor's races, we've seen, you know, Republicans be elected in Massachusetts and Maryland in 2018. And we saw Democrats be elected in Kansas, in Louisiana, and Kentucky in recent years. And so people are willing to split their tickets, but particularly at the federal level, it's decreased a lot because people see the idea of control of Congress for many people is more important than the specific House member or senator that you're voting for. They want Democrats to control Congress or Republicans to control Congress. And so as a result, they're going to vote for whoever has a D or an R next to their name. So that's not everyone. There is still ticket splitting even at the federal level, but it's gone down uh, significantly. All right, well, let's check in on Twitter. And uh, DP sent this. He's, he says this, raise the voting age to 25. What do you guys think of that? David Neer. I'm adamantly opposed to that. I think that a strong and healthy democracy is one where as many people participate as possible. We were just talking about turnout a moment ago. Uh, I think it was a terrific thing. This happened, of course, before I was born, but when the voting age was lowered nationally from 21 to 18. And I think that uh, it's at a good place right now. If we are saying to people uh, that you can serve in the military, you are old enough to drive, uh, then I think we absolutely have to extend to them the right to participate in our democracy. All right. And uh, David Beard, you can take this uh, tweet. It says this, uh, why aren't we talking about the female vote and Gen X vote this year? And it's high. What are you expecting for turnout? Sure. So I think the, the big question is whether or not um, turnout will sort of reach or exceed um, 2018 levels in terms of comparisons to a midterm, because 2018 had very high turnout for a midterm compared to past midterm years of the past couple of decades. And I think people expect turnout to be high again. So I think the question is, will we reach or and or exceed 2018? Um, in regard to, to turnout among women specifically, obviously the, the Dobbs decision has something that's caused you know, an enormous amount of output of, of anger and you know, a desire to, to reverse that. And so we've seen um, you know, turnout be high. Um, it's hard to measure exactly the degree to which you know, specifically women are turning out at higher rates, but it's definitely something to, to look at after the election to see what sort of disparity there ends up being, if any. 
And Mimi, if I could add to Go that, ahead. on the down ballot, our podcast, we have talked about this almost every single week. And there has really been some fascinating results over the summer in particular. We saw that uh, election in Kansas where an anti-abortion ballot measure was rejected in a deep red state by 18 points. And we saw uh, five special elections where Democrats overperformed their district leans and, in fact, even won a couple of stunning victories. And so that, to me, is very strong proof that we have seen a surge in turnout among women. Um, and to the person asking on Twitter, uh, this is something that uh, I think is extremely important, and it's why we've been talking about it so much on our podcast. So I'd certainly encourage them to tune in if they want to hear more about women voters and turnout among women. All right, let's talk to some callers. Uh, first up is John in Chantilly, Virginia, Democrat sign. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. First of all, I want to say the Democrats did the best thing. They put the best on the brightest. You look at the Florida, you look at the uh, 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 North, uh, South Carolina, you look at the, uh, uh, Wisconsin, they have the best candidate. But that's another the point. My point is, why can't we have a system like Alaska? Why do I need to know that Demo if I want to vote, I don't have to be a Democrat or Republican. I'm going to vote what's right. I mean, why don't, why don't we have a simple voting things to do to the people? Why is all, I don't get this. You know, and I like to hear what the, the guests say just about this. All right. Which David would like to take that? Sure, I, I can take that. I, I think there's been a, a real disparity um, in terms of candidate quality, as I think the, the um, caller mentioned, where the, um, the Democratic candidates in a number of these races have you know, really strong top level candidates who are doing great fundraising and the Republicans have nominated less than ideal candidates, I think you would say from an objective perspective. So I think that quality, you know, as we talked about with the decrease of ticket splitting, that's been a less and less important, but it does still matter. And then in regards to Alaska specifically, Alaska has started using a ranked choice voting method for the first time this year, where um, voters get to rank their choices um, you know, beyond just their first choice. And one of the things that really does is allows for you know, greater diversity of who you're selecting. So you can pick you know, a Democrat or Republican for your first choice and then you know the opposite party or an independent as your second choice and then that also sort of narrows it down you know where if somebody voted for for a candidate who had very low percentage support that candidate gets eliminated when they do the ranked choice tabulations and then your support goes to your second most you know chosen candidate and that can help you know push candidates with sort of broad support even if they're not everyone's first choice um, into victory as we saw with you know now representative Mary Peltola in the special election earlier this year all right, we have a question that came in from text, and this is from Jim in Winter Park, Florida. He says, gentlemen, hypothetically, if yesterday's horrific attack on Mr. Pelosi was done just to a 70-year-old citizen in San Francisco, would the perpetrator have been released on a no-bail desk warrant for the crime he committed due to the liberal district attorney's policies, now followed by the California lawmakers? David Neer, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that we need to take a step back and uh, look at what happened, uh, the absolutely horrific crime against Paul Pelosi and against Nancy Pelosi, because obviously they were targeted because they're the Pelosi's and because Nancy Pelosi is a Democrat, a woman and the Speaker of the House. And what we need to look at here, this was not just an ordinary crime. This was an act of political violence. And we know that for a certainty because of the political ideology espoused by the attacker, who was very heavily influenced by all sorts of far-right conspiracy theories. And the reason why it's so important to call this out is that if you don't identify the problem, then you can't find a solution. And so if you treat this as just an ordinary crime or a home invasion, then you are absolutely not going to address the incredibly serious problem of political violence that has been fomented by the right. This has been ongoing for quite some time. We saw it crescendo horrifically on January 6th, but that wasn't the end. That really was just the beginning of a new phase. And I think it's extremely important for Democratic leaders to call this out for what it was, because that's the only way that we are going to stop more political violence, which is just 
beyond unacceptable in this country. All right, let's talk to Vincent next on the Republican line in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Good morning, Vincent. Good morning. I have two comments. The first one is on voting at the age of 18. That was the biggest mistake this country has ever done. First of all, you tell an 18-year-old you can't drink, you can't buy tobacco, you can't do anything, and, 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 and here we go, you can vote. That's a joke. The so, second comment wait, Vincent, is, what, what would you want the voting age to be? Uh, I would say 21. It was 21 years of age when I, when I was there. And somebody said 25. That's probably even a better age, to be honest with you, because okay. you, the 18-year-old applies to nothing but going after the college students are all ideal. That's the reason why the Democrats want that. If you want to say that you can go to war, then fine. Anybody that served in the, in the military, and I did, then fine. You can vote, but not the whole, uh, not the whole thing. Democrats even wanted to go to 16 years of age. And Vincent, my what's your? You said you had a second point. My second point is, you're talking about the attack on Nancy Pelosi, and that's despicable. I would also like to hear from the Democrats about. Steve Cleese being shot, okay, and then the other one about the the Republican candidate that was badly beaten, uh, and 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 we hear nothing on the news. And that was like down in Florida, or somewhere in the South. It's all one-sided. Everybody's upset about Nancy. I didn't hear anybody yelling about somebody shooting Steve Cleese and other. Uh, Republicans at the ball game a few years ago. That's my All right, Vincent. David Beard, how about you? Sure. Um, well, I think there was a, a enormous coverage of Representative Scalise um, shooting when it happened, obviously, and, and I think there was strong condemnation, um, as there has been among many people, um, condemnation um, in the wake of this. I think it needs to be stronger and more consistent. And the, what we need is for people who are inflaming these types of this rhetoric and these causing leading to this type of action to tone it down and to come back to a more reasonable stand so that people don't take these incendiary claims um, about elections being stolen and about conspiracy theories and then lead them to believe that they need to take this sort of violent action, because that's the inevitable result when you have, you know, conspiracy theories being banded about in public, when people are taking these extreme positions and using violent rhetoric, this is the inevitable conclusion of that. So I think everybody needs to take responsibility to, you know, bring the tone down and to, you know, push our political culture to a place where it doesn't lead to this sort of, to this sort of violence. Jack in is, is in Estero, Florida, Independent Line. Good morning, Jack. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, C-SPAN. And uh, the gentlemen that are uh, represent podcasting, this goes out to you and all the other mainstream media. We need to educate Americans, people just in general, instead of separating them. The tools that the media has, whether it's podcasting or commercials, are all based on behaviors and getting responses from us. We're mammals. I don't want to go into deepness about, hey, mammals and everything, but we're all raised as, hey, you talk to somebody about Alabama and FSU in Georgia, they're always under contention of, hey, Alabama's the best, Georgia. We are imprinted since childhood, and our system is built on imprinting us. And for generations, people have voted, I'm going to vote Republican. I'm going to vote that my daddy did. My daddy did. Vote the issue, America. Learn to think for yourself. And I challenge the podcasters and the, the mainstream media to educate us. We're just bombarded by everyday commercials. The TV gives you uh, uh, 50 seconds of news and five different medical solutions to your problems as an example to just the imprinting. So okay. I'd just like to make All right, Jack. David Neer, so, what do you think? Do people really change their minds? 
Well, I think that the uh, caller's point about educating voters and the need for greater political education in this country is an exceptionally important one. And that's why I'm so glad that something like C-SPAN exists. And that's also why we started Daily Coast 20 years ago and why we created our podcast, The Down Ballot, precisely because there are big gaps in what the traditional media covers. And we think that it is incredibly important to fill those gaps. And, you know, obviously we have watched a very, very sad decline in media across the country, especially local media. And these kinds of down ballot races that we focus on, they simply don't get as much attention as they used to because there are fewer reporters and fewer outlets and smaller budgets devoted to covering them. And so organizations like ours and podcasts like ours, I think play a very important role in filling that gap and helping to provide the political education that this country so very much needs. We got this uh, text from Irwin in Madison, Wisconsin. He asks you this, would mandatory voting eliminate voter suppression? David Beard. I think that that is one solution. I, uh, Australia has essentially mandatory voting. You can go and cast a blank ballot. They don't require you to vote for a certain candidate in order to, to fulfill the requirements of mandatory voting in Alaska, but they do require every, everyone who's you know, a citizen who has the ability to vote to go and, and cast a ballot, even if it's blank. But I think there are a lot simpler ways. I think but, that would but be- But how a big does choice. that work actually before you sure. do that? Like how, how do they enforce mandatory voting? Sure, so if you don't vote, and there are people who sort of don't vote out of principle, you get a fine. Um, it's not something that's more, you know, they don't try to send you to jail or anything, but you get a fine like any sort of like minor civil offense. <clears throat> Um, if you don't go and vote when you know when you're supposed to, and there may I think there may be ways you could have an excuse if you were ill or something like that. But that's the idea is that you would be, you know, given a small fine if you don't you know go and vote when you're supposed to. But I think that there are a lot of simpler ways to deal with voter suppression than turning to mandatory voting. I think you can you know make it easy for people to vote, give people options. You know, don't require, don't give onerous requirements that make it more difficult. Don't allow people like we've seen recently in Arizona to, you know, watch you as you go to turn in your ballot and take photographs of you and your license plate, um, you know, in order to supposedly track like election integrity. Those things are intimidating voters and are going to make it less likely for people to go and drop off their ballots. And that would be the first thing we could do to make it easier to vote before we have to turn to mandatory voting. All right, let's talk to Matt, Bladensburg, Maryland, Democrats line. Hi, uh, I was gonna say something else, but I think this is an, that, that concept is an excellent idea of mandatory voting. Um, you know, I mean, if you have people on the right that think everybody should own a gun, I think that, you know, it makes more sense, something that everyone should be obligated to do as a citizen of this country is take part. And not only that, but I think it is. It, will, it would uh, deter people from trying to take people's rights, which they seem to like to call uh, a privilege. Uh, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. David Neer? Uh, sure. So some scholars have said that they think that mandatory voting in the United States might run afoul of the First Amendment. But it really hasn't been tried, so it's hard to know what the courts would say. But if we want to go down that route, there are other options, including, for instance, offering voters a tax credit if they have actually voted. And it would be small, but certainly an incentive. And I think that that is something that municipalities in particular could try experimenting with or states could try experimenting with. I think that could be a, a, a very useful experiment. And also, I'll, I'll add, David Beard was talking about Australia. One other thing they do in Australia, it's a tradition to... Uh, have uh, hot dogs after the elect after you vote after you cast your ballot almost everyone gets what they call a democracy sausage so maybe we should try rolling out democracy sausages here too yeah, we could do that instead of the little sticker <laughs> yeah <laughs> pete is in hebron uh, new hampshire republican line good morning yes good morning i'm i'm watching uh, your program and listening in and uh, you know it, it's just amazing here in new hampshire when we go to vote the polls open at 7 o'clock in the morning and they close at 7 in the evening. You show up, you go through the supervisor's checklist. Uh, of course, in a town of 600 people, everybody knows each other, but still you have to show proof of ID, and you go and you cast your ballot, and that's that. It's a very simple process. 
the problem with this country and our voting system is politics, politics, politics. And that's what's dividing this country. And you guys talk about this morning, you're speaking about uh, the uh, white nationalists and so forth. And you know the truth of the matter is it comes down to is nobody wants to talk about, uh, they talk about January 6th and January 6th. No one wants to answer, answer the uh, question, what about uh, the riots in 2020, cities and uh, businesses being burned to the ground, all for the sake of a few people in charge in an organization called Black Lives Matter that got rich. Nobody investigates that, though. You know, the problem with this country, then again, it still goes back to politics. Too much politics in this country. You want to get this country back together, come up with a real voting system, you know, and we can move forward from that. Until then, this country is going to, it's going to get, only going to get worse. Uh, Thank you. Have a great day. All right, Pete. David Beard. Sure. I, I think New Hampshire is an example of a state um, that hasn't made a lot of changes to make it easier to vote the way that many states have. And many states did specifically in response, obviously, to the pandemic and have continued many of those you know, expansions of voting around early voting and mail voting. And what we see is that makes it easier for people to cast their ballots. There are a lot of people, maybe they're you know, caring for a sick relative or they have or they just simply have an eight hour shift and they can't leave in the middle of the day and then they have to pick up their kids right after work. And so the idea that the polls are open for, for 12 hours and that makes it easy for everyone to, to get over to their polling place and cast their ballot, particularly as we've seen in many urban areas where there are lines for two, three, four hours to cast your ballot. Um, it's, it's simply not true that that's an easy way to vote, that everyone should be able to you know, make it into those 12 hour periods on election day and cast their ballot. Now maybe you know, in a small town in New Hampshire where nobody you know, drives an hour for work and everything, you know, maybe that works. But what we've seen across the country and in other countries as well, is that when mail balloting is available, when early voting is available, more people vote. And I think ultimately that's what we want. We want you know, people to be voting. We want to make sure that our democracy is representative. And when we make it difficult to vote so that only a small number of people are the ones casting the ballots, that is not truly a representative democracy. Mary Lou tweeted this. She said, my state of Ohio is being destroyed by far right Trump supporting state legislators. Gerrymandering is rampant. One third of our Republican led state legislature is under investigation for sexual misconduct and financial crimes. It's a sewer and judges should not be elected. David Near, several things there. Yeah, so I definitely agree. Judges shouldn't be elected. Unfortunately, this is the system that we have right now, including in Ohio, where the state Supreme Court is control of that body is on the ballot in November. Right now, Republicans have a narrow four to three majority there. Democrats are hoping to flip that and turn that into a four to three Democratic majority. And that also directly relates to the uh, correspondence other issue regarding uh, corruption and gerrymandering. Ohio voters several years ago passed reforms at the ballot box that said, we don't want politicians to draw their own lines, that we think this should be an independent process and that the lines should be fair. And those uh, reforms passed at the ballot box. And then Republicans in Ohio did everything in their power to ignore them. And what wound up happening is they passed more gerrymandered maps. The state Supreme Court said, no, these aren't acceptable. These violate the state constitution. These are unfair partisan gerrymanders that are unconstitutional. And then they ran out the clock. They simply refused to pass compliant maps. And that as a result, state election officials wound up having to use maps that were still gerrymanders. This is a really, really unfortunate situation. And what for Ohio going forward, I think the only real answer is going to be to pass yet another set of reforms at the ballot box. It's expensive and difficult. You have to get a lot of signatures statewide to put something on the ballot. But I think Ohio needs more potent redistricting reform to simply stop Republicans from gerrymandering because they clearly won't stop of their own court. All right, let's go to Princeton, New Jersey, independent line. John, good morning. Good morning, thanks for taking my call. I'd love to hear uh, the response of your guests to uh, and I, the feeling I get that, uh, you know, first there's good news. Uh, apparently our votes are still very important. Millions and millions and millions of dollars get spent on getting people to vote. Uh, 
but along with that comes the fact that the best way to get people to vote, particularly uh, if you're appealing to a minority, is to get them mad and say really incendiary things. What would our guests say about better education of voters to let them know that, you know, that these obvious, to me, ways of manipulating uh, their decision is what's really going on here? Thank you. David Beard. Sure. So I think that, st unfortunately, people often say that they don't want negative advertising. They don't you know, want to see it. They want to hear about the issues when you ask them. They want to see you know, positive goals for the country. But then when you actually do studies of which ads are more effective, um, study after study shows that negative advertising is more effective at moving votes than positive advertising. And of course, for both sides, the goal is to win elections. The goal is not to, you know, have the nicest campaign. When you're in an election, it's zero sum. Somebody wins and somebody loses. And so it would be irresponsible, frankly, for either side to not do negative campaigning if it's the most effective way to campaign when they're trying to win the election. Now, what I want to go back to then is the real problem, which is the enormous amount of money which is in politics and which is, again, really unique um, in the American system versus other democratic countries that simply placed limits on either how much money somebody could donate or how much money a campaign could spend. Now, the Supreme Court has said that that is unconstitutional. Um, so there is unfortunately no easy way to, to solve that problem in the short term. Um, localities have experimented with giving you know, every voter basically democracy bucks. I don't remember exactly what they're called, with the idea that you have a voucher that you could use to donate to candidates to try to sort of even out that playing field around spending. But the problem is when there's billions of dollars um, in you know, campaigns to do this sort of advertising, people are going to spend that money on the most effective way of advertising. And that's always going to be you know, negative campaigning more than it is positive issue-based ads. Let's, talk, let's go to Bradenton, Florida on the Democrats line. Uh, yet another David, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank God uh, Nancy Pelosi was not home because had she been killed by this misguided treatment, it would have started a whole chain of events. Next thing you know, that uh, it would have become a tit-for-tat situation and, and a misguided left-winger would have, would have targeted a Republican uh, legislator the same way. This, who knows where this could lead to? Possibly a a violent uh, civil war. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we can thank Donald Trump and his supporters for for his misguided lying lying to them. For all this is what, what's been going on. I'm, I'm 85 years old. I've been voting since 1960. I, I'm uh, I followed politics ever since then. I think I know what's going on. Thank you very much. David Neary, your thoughts? I agree that we're in a really scary place. I think the likes of which we really haven't seen in this country, at least in living memory. And it's very important, again, to emphasize that lies have consequences. When you tell people falsely, falsely that elections are rigged, that their votes don't count, that Democrats are stealing elections, then these sorts of people are going to be influenced by that. And what they're going to hear from that is, well, there's no point in voting because the elections are rigged. So therefore, I have to resort to other means. And those other means are terrible and unacceptable and violent. And Republicans, especially Donald Trump and his most fanatic adherents, have no problem with this. And that really sickens my soul because there is no room for violence in American politics, in any democracy. And this sort of violence is what happens when you lie repeatedly to the American people. The, act, the truest act of courage that, you, that a politician can perform in politics is to tell the truth. And that is sometimes the case when the truth is hard and the truth may indeed be very hard for Republicans. But if the GOP were being honest with its supporters, it would say, we lost fair and square in 2020. It was unfortunate. We don't want that to happen again. We have to work harder and do better so that it doesn't happen again. But 
frankly, it seems like it's more satisfying for Donald Trump to make up stories about the explanations for his loss. And that has had grave and terrible consequences. And really, you know, this is not a both sides issue. Democrats are not telling these same kinds of lies at all. In fact, they're pushing back against them. So I think this problem is only going to stop when the GOP turns away from this kind of rhetoric. And uh, David Beard, here's a question for you from Jason in Honolulu. He says this, has there ever been a situation regarding problems with mail-in voting leading to serious reconsideration of its validity? Um, not that I'm aware of. That's not to say that, you know, millions and millions of mail ballots are cast and there's not a, you know, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 issue where, um, you know, a mail ballot gets lost or something like that. But, you know, USPS, you know, has an incredible track record. Track record. It's a great institution of America. And people forget how great of a job the Postal Service does because we expect it. We expect mail to show up every day. We expect letters to make their way, you know, across the country in a handful of days. They know what they're doing, and they work closely with elections offices across the country to make sure that, you know, mail ballots, when they're turned in, um, get to the elections office on time, that they're handled carefully, that they're kept secure. And the elections offices themselves go through a whole process to ensure that the mail ballot is, is valid and, and accurate in that, you know, a voter signed it, um, that it's matched to that voter's registration. Like, this is not something that's treated casually. People, you know, the people who work at the Postal Service and the people who work at these elections offices take this incredibly seriously, and they have a great track record of, you know, getting these things right. All right, and we'll just end with uh, a text we got from Danette in Portland, Oregon, who says, in high school, there should be four years of civics, history, political science required to graduate. That'll be our last word. David Neer, uh, David Beard, co-host of the Down Ballot podcast with the Daily Coast. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today's Washington Journal. We'll be back again tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Eastern time right here on C-SPAN. In the meantime, have a great Saturday. C-SPAN is your unfiltered view of government.